Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. All right, Bob, we got a pretty fun AMA today here. But before we do, I don't think I realized until looking at your background that the Boston Bruins had a 30-year drought in which they did not win their division, 1940 to 1970. Oh, I'm glad I missed that drought. <laughs> was that 1940? Was that when there was fewer teams? I mean, it'd be. Oh yeah, there was really only six teams. Really embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. That's well, it's not as embarrassing as the Maple Leafs, who haven't won the Stanley Cup since I think 1967. So. Oh my goodness. Well, if any team deserves a Stanley Cup, it's Toronto. I I, <laughs> I enjoyed. I think I sent you a video of a guy talking about, um, you know, that's bad enough. But was it a year ago or a couple of years ago? They lost to a backup goaltender. It was a Zamboni driver for their uh, yeah right at the for ACC the, for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful story, though. Yeah. All right, so we've got a pretty fun topic, an important topic on the docket today, which is effectively kind of scratching the exercise itch as it pertains to longevity, uh, but at a at a probably a, a deeper level than folks are are used to. So, um, where should we start? I think we should start with well. Aerobic fitness or cardio uh, cardio respiratory fitness? Because I think we've got a few of things that uh, these questions have come in. I think a bunch of questions related to this, which is studies that look at how much lean mass you have and whether that is a predictor of longevity. And then there's also studies that talk about muscle strength, not not just uh, muscle mass, and whether that predicts longevity and whether one of those is better than the other. Um, but I think a good place to start is with cardio respiratory fitness. With similar question, you know, is 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 better does better lead to less mortality and does lower cardiorespiratory fitness lead to higher mortality or is it at least associated okay so let's let's start by kind of explaining to folks the the metrics that that we're going to talk about through this so um the the most common thing i think we see in the literature is either mets metabolic equivalence or vo2 max um and i think part of that is it's quite objective um, so if anybody's had a VO2 max test, they'll understand how objective and unpleasant it is. Uh, it's, I think we've talked about this before. So you are hooked up to, um, an indirect calorimeter. So it's a device that provides complete occlusion around your mouth and your nose. Typically this device also sort of plugs your nose. So you're only breathing through your mouth. And the important thing is that the device has two sensors on it. One sensor measure, measures the concentration of oxygen that is being expelled. And uh, that for the purpose of this discussion, that's the more important of the sensors. But for what it's worth, the other one is also measuring the concentration of carbon dioxide that's expelled. So because we know the concentration of oxygen and CO2 on the way in by knowing what comes out, and obviously oxygen will be lower, CO2 will be higher, we know how much carbon dioxide was produced and how much oxygen was consumed. And knowing those two things gives you a flow rate, a VO2 and a VCO2. Those two pieces of information alone tell you how much energy you're utilizing via something called the, um, the Fick equation, if I'm not mistaken. So mm. total energy consumption is 3.94 times VO2 plus, I think it's 1.11 times VCO2 at any point in time. So if you have for this minute, VO2 was this, VCO2 was that, you apply it to that equation and it will tell you you know, you were, you know, utilizing 10 kilocalories per minute, which would be, you know, 600 kilocalories per hour, which is, you know, um, I do this sometimes when I'm doing my zone two, my zone two tends to be about 780 kilocalories per hour. Um, so interesting, but you know, again, that's not how I test zone two. I'm using lactate for zone two, but now what we're talking about is something different, which is what is the maximum utilization of oxygen? So if you make somebody work harder and harder and harder, so if they're on a bike and you keep adding wattage to the bike and they have to pedal against more and more resistance, or if they're on a treadmill and you make them run faster and faster and up at higher and higher incline, at some point they will reach a maximum at which point they can no longer 
utilize more oxygen. Now, we're not going to go into the why right now, but I believe that Alex Hutchinson and I covered that in some depth in our podcast, you may recall. And we talked about some of the alveolar limitations, how much of that is being limited at the gas exchange surface versus how much is being exchanged in the actual, uh, pardon, how much of that is being limited in the muscle. But regardless of which of those it is, and it it's possible it's a combination or it's possible that at low levels of fitness, it's more in the muscle and at high levels of fitness, it might be more in the lung. Um, but that number is the VO2 max. When you're doing the test, it's measured typically in liters per minute, but then we normalize it by body weight. So we normalize it as liters per well, we do it actually as milliliters per kilogram per minute. So when you start to hear the numbers that people kick around, um, you know, the fittest of the fit are going to be north of 80. But what does that mean? It means they're north of 80 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute. And I think actually uh, Alex and I talked about that on the podcast, right? The highest ever recorded person was probably about 96 or so. Yeah. And, you know, any sort of elite athlete, um, elite cardiac, you know, type athlete, right? So runner, cyclist, uh, rower, those sorts of athletes, you know, they're generally going to be above 70. So what does that number tell us about mortality? Right. I mean, I think that's, that's a, that's a question. And, um, I think we've got some data to talk about that. So do you want to, you want to pull out one of these slides here? Yeah, let's pull it up. All right. Got to slide up now. Okay. So um, this took a group of people. Do you recall how old they were? I don't, but I'm looking right here. Uh, let's see. 53, about 53 on average. Okay. Right, mean age. So, and it ran them through a VO2 max test and then it ranked them. And low were people who scored, I believe in the bottom 25th percentile. These are non equally weighted groups if my memory serves me correctly. Um, but I think that low were the people in the bottom 25th percentile. Check me on that. Below average, I think was 25th to 50 percentile and then 50 to 75th percentile was above average and high was like 75th to maybe 95th and elite was just that top 5%. I, I, I'm probably off by a little bit, but directionally that's true. I just want to make sure people don't look at these and think that each of them represents 20% of the population. Yeah, I think that's directionally accurate. I'm looking at the their table one, their patient demographics. It's interesting. So it's a total of 122,000 patients. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the low, below average, and, av and above average, and high, they're, they're all about 30,000 participants in each one of those groups. And then you've got the elite, and there's a little over 3,500 versus the 30,000 that's split amongst those other groups. Got it. Yep. Okay. So that's, that's yep. about what we just said there. Okay. So, and we're looking at all cause mortality here. Um, and you can see a pretty clear trend. Uh, so two things stand out, right? The, the two things that stand out are, um, there's kind of a monotonic relationship between fitness and mortality. Uh, but the second thing that stands out is by far the biggest gap is between the people in the bottom 25%, which are categorized as low fitness and, um, basically everyone above them. So if, if you go to the next, uh, figure, Bob, I think we get to see this in a little bit more detail. Um, yes. Yeah. I like this. I like this figure, frankly, more because it, it allows us to see a bit more interesting stuff. So, um, here we can see, uh, both for all patients. Uh, so lumping everyone in together, male and female, if you have a uh, low fitness, uh, and then comparing it to everybody else, what's the risk reduction? So if you go from low to below average to above average, to high to elite, you can see what is the hazard ratio. So it's interesting going from just being low to being below average is a 50% reduction in mortality over a decade. If you're starting in your fifties. We're going to come back to that, but that is so important, right? It is. It seems like a weird message to give to somebody that, you know, I, I want you to be below average, but that is definitely a st step up from low in, in terms of how they categorize these. 
That's right. Um, if you then go from low to above average, it's about a 60% or 70% reduction in mortality. And it just continues monotonically to increase. Again, the lowest improvement is, is going from high to elite. That doesn't buy you a whole heck of a lot. Um, it is still t statistically significant. And that's to see that, you have to look at um, figure C. Again, this is going to be one of those podcasts where it's really going to be better to watch this over video. Um, because you, you know, the data just speak for themselves. And of course the show notes are going to include all of these. So make sure you're, you're looking at this, but remember the hazard ratio for mortality is the reciprocal of the, um, hazard ratio of risk reduction. So <clears throat> a tables, a and C are basically showing you similar things in the group comparison. So again, when I said that going from high to elite, didn't have as much of a benefit. You can see it has the smallest hazard ratio of um, improvement in benefit or the reduction going from elite to, to sorry, going from high to elite. It's 29%. But notice that the confidence interval does not ca cross one and therefore the p-value is less than 0.05. Now, here's what's interesting. What they've done, and you can see all of these listed, right? So if you compare someone of low fitness to elite, it is a five-fold difference in mortality over a decade, which is pretty remarkable. And that's what they show you above. They give you context. They put this in the context of other things that we commonly understand as being problematic for mortality, namely smoking, coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and end-stage renal disease. So look at these differences, right? So if you're, and I believe Bob, this is not just for someone who's currently smoking. This is if you've ever smoked, right? Yes. I think it was previously used or used tobacco. So they're really looking at uh, the difference between never smokers. So you've never smoked in your lifetime to if you've ever smoked. Okay. That's right. And that's a 41% increase in mortality over the decade. Coronary artery disease, 29%. Diabetes, 40% high blood pressure, 21%. And the most of all of these things, end-stage renal disease, about 280% increase in mortality. Now, we all understand what that means, but now when you compare that to these, the differences in these fitness levels, it gives you, at least in my opinion, a greater appreciation for how much improvement in mortality comes from improving your fitness. So if you look at the biggest driver of mortality, which would be end-stage renal disease in this cohort, it's the same as going from low cardiorespiratory fitness to above average cardiorespiratory fitness. So going from the bottom 25th percentile to being in the 50th to 75th percentile, which is a totally achievable feat, as you'll see in a moment. Um, anything else you want to say about this, Bob, aside from the yeah, fact that it's sort yeah, of stunning? <laughs> it is. It's really striking. So one little... Uh, pro tip or amateur tip <laughs> is when Peter was talking about the <laughs> Peter's talking about the reciprocals is that if you look at figure 2a and then you look at figure 2c and you look at the group comparisons if you want to see those that plotted point for example on the way on the right hand side of figure 2a elite versus low you can take that you can look at figure 2c where it says low versus elite and the hazard ratio is 5 you just take the I mean the reciprocal is just Take one divided by five, and you get well, you get point two. Yep. And then if you you look at that, so then when you look at the chart, it seems it it makes sense. And then high versus low, for example, it's three point nine for hazard ratio, which is about four. So one divided by four is about point two five. That checks out. Um, so just a little pro tip for the the fans out there. Of, and that's that's helpful because these graphs have a, a a log linear axis, so it's not intuitive to look at these things. Um, you know, going from low to below average gives you half of the benefit, but you'll never get the remaining half ever because that would imply immortality, which obviously um, isn't happening. Hmm. Okay. So now let's put some numbers to this because this is one of those things that we use a lot with our patients because we want most of our patients, uh, we want all of them doing this, but not all of them are willing to do it, but we certainly want everybody to have a VO2 max test. 
um, so that we can kind of benchmark them on their way to their centenarian Olympics. So let's actually see what these numbers look like. I think there's another graph here, right? Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a member. We created the membership program to bring you more in-depth exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many, and beyond the complete episodes of the AMA each month, they include the following. Ridiculously comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing we discuss on each episode of The Drive. Access to our private podcast feed. The Qualies, which are a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, released every Tuesday through Friday, which highlight the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is particularly important for those of you who haven't heard all of the back episodes. It becomes a great way to go back and filter and decide which ones you want to listen to in detail. Really steep discount codes for products I use and believe in, but for which I don't get paid to endorse and benefits that we continue to add over time. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Lastly, if you're already a member, but you're hearing this, it means you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the AMA and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at peteratiamd.com forward slash members. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.